student, so grateful for our student leaders and our youth staff, man, just incredible. I received a letter earlier this year that um, back in the spring that actually meant a tremendous amount to me. And uh, I've got it right here. And, and if that's all the detail I gave you, you may or may not take an interest in this letter. Um, but if I told you this was written actually three years ago yesterday, this was written July the 2nd, 2019, but I only just got it this year. Maybe a few more of you might take a little more of an interest in the letter. Um, but if I told you my mom wrote this letter to me, then maybe a few more of you might would take an interest. If you know my life and my story, which some of you do and some of you don't, my mom went to heaven in October of 2019. And apparently she wrote this letter about three months before she passed away. And it was tucked away and hidden until my dad found it earlier this year. Anybody interested in this letter now? That, that's the power of context, right? Some of us get letters in the mail and it goes immediately in the recycle bin, right? You know what I'm talking about? It looks like junk mail. It looks like whatever. But if you don't have any context, you may not appreciate what it is. Um, see, the story is my, my mom was just the most amazing, thoughtful person. And uh, she knew that she was ending the race uh, with cancer and apparently sat down and wrote letters to my dad and myself and my other three siblings. Um, but because she was just so incredible, she didn't tell anybody about them. Neither did she do the obvious thing and like make them where you could find them. She just kind of tucked it away, contented for whenever it would be found. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing, right? So of course, we don't know anything about it. My dad was cleaning up their office area one day at his house and noticed some papers that looked like maybe some mail had fallen behind the desk on a little shelf underneath. And he's cleaning out and he finds a stack of letters. And because they had been married for almost 45 years, he knew exactly what it was. And he called me and said, Nathan, it's too precious for me to mail. I'd be scared to death. We would lose it. No, no shade to any postal workers. I, I don't. <laughs> He just, it, he was concerned personally. Uh, he says, so I want to hand deliver it to you. And so, so he did. Now, um, I'm not going to read this to you. Just, just let you know that. But I am going to read uh, an opening line. Because you see, this was my mom sharing her thoughts, her final thoughts to me about who I am. About what she believed about me about how much she loved me, about how much she loved Jesus and the confidence she had in where she would be by the time I read this and the comfort she wanted to give me to know she knew exactly where she was gonna be. Wow, what a great lady. But she starts like this, my dearest Nathan, as I'm starting this letter to you, I am remembering with a rush of memories the first letter I wrote you on your first birthday and I sealed it for you to read when you graduated from high school. How many of you are interested in that letter, <laughs> right? You see, context is everything. And if you don't pay attention to the context, you could skip through a letter and miss it. The beautiful thing is, and because you are such wonderful people and you came to church this morning, I'm gonna show you, I also have that letter right here. Written January 18th, 1981, my first birthday. My mom sat down and wrote this in the opening line, say, I'm just finished your first birthday party and I'm watching you play on the floor. Man, I'm not trying to make you cry, right? I've cried a bunch of times, but there's a point to all of this. I'm going somewhere with this. She says, you know, I'm the firstborn in our family. She's like, I, I never knew if I'd be a mom. And now that I am, I don't know if God will give me the grace to see you grow old. So just in case, I want you to know what I think about you. I want you to know what I think about your father, how much I love and respect him. And I want you to know about my savior, Jesus. And she shares the plan of salvation with me. 
and it sat in our family Bible. How many of you were here when Pastor Jay showed that old giant Bible that was given to us recently? Our family had one not quite that cool, but that big, you know, where you just were like, that could kill you. You know, you just felt... And so my mom wrote this letter to me and said, you can open it on the day you graduate high school. A lot of my buddies and friends had high school trips and things planned. I just wanted to go home after high school graduation. You know why? My entire life, I knew this letter was sitting in that Bible. Can y'all see this little tear right here? Y'all see that? That's nine-year-old Nathan trying to open the letter. And yes, I did get a whooping. Okay, so... In Jesus' name. Uh, (laughs) Context is everything. Sometimes we can forget the New Testament, several of these books of the Bible, they're letters. And they were written by a person. And they were written to specific people who had certain circumstances they were going through. And the person who wrote the letter had reasons for writing it. And they understood what was going on in the moment. And and the context is everything. And if you don't know that, sometimes you can just think, well, Nathan, I'm glad you got this letter, but it wasn't written to me. And I don't know much about it, so good for you. But once you get a little more background, then you're like, I actually would love to read that. Because whether it was written to you or not, can I tell you something? You would glean a lot from this if you read this. And just me telling you about this one, you probably gleaned a lot already. You learned a lot about my mom. You learned a lot about me. You learned a lot about the way our family operates. And you learned that my mom, at the beginning of my life and at the end of hers, wanted to make sure that I knew who Jesus was and that I would trust him with all of my days. And I intend to do that. But sometimes when we're reading the Bible, we forget that it's a letter. It's a love letter to you, but it was physically, many of these books were letters to people. And oftentimes the author will say, in my previous letter, just like my mom did. And when you realize the context, all of a sudden it becomes interesting and compelling to go look that up and read that letter because of the context that it provides. Are you following me today? We're starting a new series today through the letter to the Ephesians. And if you've got your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. And I'm going to encourage you to turn to chapter 2. So as we start the series today, I'm just going to give you an overview, kind of an introduction to the letter to the church at Ephesus which is why it's called Ephesians, because the people that lived in Ephesus are called Ephesians. And going to try to give you some context and hopefully give you enough context to where just like my letter, it may start out as obscure and vaguely interesting to you, but by the time you have a little more information, you might be really excited to read the letter. And that's my goal for today. If you've got your Bibles, Ephesians 2, would you stand? Uh, We're just going to honor God's word. I'm going to read... There's really no perfect summary verse for the whole letter of Ephesians, but this was my best effort, and that's to identify Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. I'm going to read it in two different versions. God saved you, verse 8, by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I'm going to read that same verse in the message translation. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do, work we had better be doing. And I think it sums up the letter to the Ephesians in such a great way. We're going to talk about that in the next few minutes. But let's make a declaration about these words in this letter to God's church and to us today. Are you ready? Go. I will hide this word in my heart that I might not sin against God. 
This word is life to my body and health to my bones. I will be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And I'm confident of this, that he who has begun a good work in me will complete it in Jesus' name. Come on, give somebody a high five before you sit down. Today's message will be a little different than what we typically would do on a Sunday morning because I, my task is to introduce the book we call the book of Ephesians, this letter to the church at Ephesus. So I'm going to try to create that context in a similar way that I tried to give you some context for these letters that my mom wrote me. Because even though you may not have a lot of understanding, I'm telling you, you will glean tremendously from this letter. So that's what I'm going to try to do over these next few moments as we prepare to go through the next six weeks through the book of Ephesians. And I say that because the first idea is this. It's, we call it a book of the Bible because it's part of the collection of Scripture, but it's not a book. It's a letter. Uh, so keep that in mind. It is a letter. Second thought is this. Um, the very first verse in Ephesians tells us that Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Well, some of you will have a little asterisk in your Bible that will tell you those words in Ephesus don't show up in all of the earliest manuscripts. Why is that important? Some question if it was actually written to the Ephesian church only, or if it was a circular letter, meaning they were supposed to circulate it throughout the entire region. Why do I tell you that? It really is indifferent because Ephesus was the major city in Asia Minor and everything flowed through it. So regardless if it was to Ephesus or to the area of Asia Minor, it would have had to gone to the Ephesians in order to do that. I highlight that because some people like to split hairs on things like this and say, see, they changed the Bible. See, I told you they've tampered with it. They've changed it. When people are making those accusations, they're accusing people through the ages of changing the meaning of the content of scripture. An example would be, well, I know the Bible, now it says Jesus died and he rose on the third day, but it used to say Jesus never died and he took a walk on the third day. That would be a complete changing of the scripture. Somebody bringing clarification to a geographic area is not changing the scriptures, okay? That's clarification. So I tell you that because if someone tries to get you with that, it's really a straw man argument. Um, it, it really has no water. So this scripture, these, these books of the Bible have been tested and tested and tested because people have been trying to poke holes in them for generations. It's only proven its validity over and over and over. So that's why I tell you that so you don't get into a gotcha conversation on that. Um, you know, if we're going to get context today as we get ready to look at Ephesians, we need to know at least a couple things about Ephesus, the city where the Ephesians lived, and something about the author, Paul. So that's what I'm going to try to do in these next 10 or 15 minutes. So hang with me. Ephesus uh, is located in modern day Turkey. It's not called Ephesus now, but in modern day Turkey. And it was, uh, it's on the coast of Asia Minor. It was made the capital of the Roman province of Asia Minor by Augustus. It was one of the five largest cities in the world at the time of the writing. Uh, it had an estimated population of 250,000 people. And in biblical times, that's a big, big city. It was a major commercial port. And it was famous because it housed the Temple of Artemis, we're going to talk about in a second. There was a theater there that seated 24,000 people. Now, I think I've got some pictures of these places. So maybe you can see a picture of this theater. That is the ruins of the theater. And I think this is before electricity, before amplification. They designed this so that you could hear people. 24,000 people could hear people speaking and acting on that stage. We think our technology is impressive. That's pretty impressive to me, right? This is a snapshot of Ephesus, a picture of the temple of Artemis. This is an artist rendering. It's now in ruins. It's said to be four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens, Greece. It was gigantic. And then this is an image of Artemis, who was the goddess that was worshiped in the city of Ephesus. She was the deity of the region. And people came from all over Asia Minor to worship Artemis. And we see that in Scripture, especially in Acts 19. I'm going to read a passage from Acts 19 
to just show you that Paul was very familiar with this city, uh, I'm going to read in verse 8. And it happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. He entered the synagogue for three months, spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with them, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. That was a location, a assembly meet place in Ephesus. Verse 10, this continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. That's key and important because this tells us Paul stayed in Ephesus personally for over two and a half years. Some say as many as three years teaching every single day. And it says that all of the people from Asia Minor that made their way through Ephesus heard the gospel. This is why later on he would write a letter to those churches in Ephesus and the surrounding area because of the gospel witness that had been presented in that city. If you read Acts 19, you'll learn about how there's a major riot that takes place right after this portion of scripture that I read to you. Because so many people are hearing the gospel and getting saved, they're no longer worshiping Artemis, that weird looking statue thing that we just looked at that has the giant temple. And... There's some artisans in the city of Ephesus that are so offended, and can I just be honest with you, they're not offended necessarily that people aren't worshiping Artemis, they're offended because people now are not buying the statues of Artemis that they make. And here's what I found to be true in my brief 42 years walking the earth, any kind of idolatry is always a facade for self-worship. I say this is the thing I'm worshiping, but truly it's because I can manipulate that thing to get what I want. And so truly, they weren't so upset about people not worshiping Artemis. They worshiped money, and people weren't buying their little statues, so they want to lynch Paul. And that story is fascinating. It's there in Acts 19. It'd be a great story for you to read. But that's some of the background. Now that we know a little bit about Ephesus, don't you feel smarter? You know that about Ephesus? And you all look smarter just instantly. You really do. So I'm so proud of you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Paul because we're going to spend six weeks reading this letter to these people. So we need to know something about that place, those people, and the one who wrote the letter. Paul was a missionary. He was a theologian. He wrote 13 epistles. Epistles is the word for letter. 13 letters that make up almost one-fourth of the New Testament. 16 chapters of the book of Acts are all about Paul's missionary endeavors, including chapter 19 I just referenced. Paul is the author or the subject of nearly one-third of the entire New Testament. Paul was a big deal. And Paul was one of the greatest gospel presenters that gives us, uh, God used him to write scripture that we now even to this day benefit from. He was born in a Jewish family in Tarsus of Cilicia sometime in the first decade of the first century. He was born of the tribe of Benjamin and he was named after the most prominent member of that family, King Saul. Now something you have to understand about why people had two names, especially in the Bible. You hear about Simon Peter, and we hear about Paul, whose name was Saul, but then we call him Paul. What's that all about? I'm so glad you asked. So because these are Jewish people, ethnically and religiously, these are Jewish people living in a Roman-occupied area, they would have their family name, their Hebrew name, in Hebrew, the word Saul is Shaul, so his name was Shaul, like King Shaul. We call it Saul in English. But not everybody was Jewish and not everybody spoke Hebrew in the society they lived in, so they would also have a Roman or Greek name, in his case, Paulos, which we call Paul. So it's not that his name was changed or something or his identity shifted. He always had these two names and he was referred to as Shaul or Saul among the Jewish people and he was referred to as Paul among the non-Jewish people until later he is primarily referred to as Paul. Same person, just want to make sure you understand that. An early Christian tradition lets us understand that Paul's parents were very likely prisoners of war who came from Giscala to Tarsus. They had been enslaved by a Roman citizen. 
They served as slaves, were later freed, and then granted their citizenship. This is really, really important. This is why Paul would have been born with Roman citizenship. And that's a big deal if you read the New Testament scriptures because that served him well in so many areas. It's also important because Paul has a lot to say in his letters about slaves and their masters. And again, this is why context is important. All of a sudden, recognizing that Paul's own parents had been slaves gives us insight. He's not, he's not just hypothetically thinking of things. He's speaking from firsthand experience. This is where context helps us as we read the scriptures. He was educated in Jerusalem, studied under Rabbi Gamaliel, who is still studied to this day in Jewish yeshivas, very prominent rabbi. We first find Paul in Acts chapter 7. Some of you remember this is where Stephen was martyred, the very first martyr, the first martyr for Jesus. Stephen, he's martyred. And it says that as the people are throwing stones to kill Stephen, they set their cloaks at the foot of a guy named Saul that we know as Paul. He wasn't always this great guy. He was a terrorist among Christians because he was so offended by Jewish people believing in Jesus that he would go city to city, door to door, dragging people out, having them thrown in prison or killed because of their faith in Jesus until Jesus took matters into his own hands. The resurrected Jesus, who had already died on the cross, ascended into heaven, appears as a shining light to Paul. This is Acts chapter 9. He appears as a shining light to Paul on the road to Damascus in Syria. These are real places. On the road to Damascus. And it says that the shining light knocked Saul, Paul off of his donkey. He laid on the ground. He was blind for three days. And he heard a voice say, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? And Jesus goes on to tell him, I'm going to use you to be my witnesses in the earth. From that moment forward, miraculous stories. And he did share the gospel all across the Middle East and into Europe. Towards the end of Paul's life, he's arrested, sent to Caesarea. He's in prison for two years, waiting trial. It keeps going long, so as a Roman citizen, he appeals to Rome. He's sent to Rome and was in ha under house arrest for two years there. And it's while he's under house arrest in Rome that he writes a letter called Philemon. He writes a letter to the church in Colossae called Colossians. He writes a letter to Philippi called Philippians. And he writes a letter to the church in Ephesus that we call Ephesians. So Paul, who's in prison in Rome is writing a letter that to this day we're reading that's drawing us closer to Jesus through the revelations that he received. To wrap up his life story, early Christian tradition tells us in that Roman trial, he was either acquitted and set free or exiled from the city of Rome. And it's believed that he fulfilled his dream of going to take the gospel as far as Spain. And that's Romans 15. And in that time frame, he wrote first and second Timothy and the letter Titus that we have in the New Testament. Ultimately, he was condemned by Emperor Nero of Rome and beheaded with a sword in Rome around AD 67. I found this to be fascinating. There's, no, there's nowhere in the, in the scriptures that tells us anything about what Paul looked like or any kind of reference for how he uh, appeared. The book of Galatians gives us a little bit of insight. He probably had poor eyesight. Um, it, there's some references there that give us that impression. And anytime he signs his name, it's always in big letters. And that's, that's something that's referenced by a lot of the biblical scholars. But I found this. There is one description of Paul's appearance that shows up in the Apocrypha. That's outside of Scripture. That's outside of the Bible. But take it for what it's worth. I thought it was entertaining. The earliest description of Paul's appearance appears in the Apocrypha and says this, Paul was a man of small stature with a bald head and crooked legs in a good state of body with eyebrows that met in the middle, a nose that was somewhat hooked but full of friendliness. <laughs> I love that description. It's like they got him, and they're like, but he's, he's sweet. He's a sweet kid, <laughs> sweet guy, you know. He had the uni brow and he had his bow legged, but I'm just telling you, that guy, a sweet guy right there, you know. 
That's how I interpret that. You can read that however you want to. Why do I think that's important for us to study the book of Ephesians? Because I think so often we can discount ourselves. We read the Bible and we think, man, these people, we sanitize everything about their lives. We think they woke up and the angels ushered them into breakfast every morning and it was just easy and just the, the things glowed and there were halos and angels. No, he was just bow-legged and had a unibrow and probably couldn't see super great and got beat up everywhere he went. If you read the law, he got beat up everywhere he went. I'm not even joking. Stoned to death, stat, and stoned with rocks. They're not stoned with rocks, just you know what I'm saying. Stoned to death and, and all kinds of stuff. And, you, and we can say, oh, but God can't use me. Can I just tell you, he's responsible for a third of the New Testament scriptures. He was just a guy that said yes. Just a guy that said yes. And so I don't know where you are in life or what you're doing, but don't discount your story. Don't discredit yourself. His parents were likely slaves. Yeah, he was educated. Yeah, he had, he had learned, but, and he had gotten a lot of things wrong and got it wrong big. And yet the Lord still had a plan for his life. And we are still benefiting from his yes. So don't discount yourself because God's got great things he wants to do. So that's a bit about the setting. That's a bit about Ephesus. That's a bit about Paul. So what are some big ideas from this letter, Ephesians? We're going to unpack chapter by chapter over the next six weeks. Well, last week, uh, Johnny Jernigan did a great job of, of demonstrating the kingdom of God and what it means to be in the kingdom. You guys remember this about the pool? You guys remember the pool? How many of you were interceding for Johnny that he didn't slide that thing? And I heard some mumbling and intercession and groaning taking place because in one of the services, literally, he, he just about did a split. So I was, I was really grateful that he made it through. But I love that image, that picture. And uh, Ephesians really gives us that idea and extends it. Uh, some of you will be familiar with a Venn diagram. If you don't know what that is, there's a picture I'm going to show you right here. A Venn diagram is where you got two sets represented by circles and where they overlap, right? So let's say the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is, is that a circle right there, and it, it's blue like a pool, so I'm trying to make this easy for you, okay? So that, that's where we want to be in relationship with Jesus, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, and if, if circle B is the world, the fallen nature of man, the world that we all exist in, truly Christians are designed to be those that are in the world, but not of the world. Are you seeing that? And we are supposed to be those that are right there in the intersection of the world and the kingdom of God. And the truth is, we're supposed to be expanding that center section more and more as we bring the kingdom of heaven to earth so that God's will is done on earth as it is. That's the Lord's prayer. And that's what Jesus was wanting us to be about, being about the Father's business in the world today. Because this is the truth. It's something you've heard before. It's nothing new, but it's very potent. The kingdom of God is both now and not yet. We are living, what is kingdom? It's king's dominion. That's what a kingdom is. Anywhere the king has authority is the kingdom of that king. And we, as we submit our lives to God through Christ Jesus, we are submitting our lives to his kingdom authority. And we want to see that kingdom expand, and we do that by living out the gospel, by living out our faith in obedience to his word, so that we carry the kingdom of heaven into the world. Does that make sense? The book of Ephesians really explains that to us in great degree. There's two big ideas in Ephesians that are broken down in two clear sections of the letter. The first section there's about three, there's six chapters in Ephesians. The first three chapters really are all about our identity in Christ and who he is, the revelation of who Jesus is and who we are in him. And then the second half of the letter, the last three chapters are how we are to live with that understanding and what we're to do to bring the kingdom of heaven into the world. Does that make sense? That's what really we're going to be unpacking over the next six weeks as we look at the letter to the Ephesians. Now, 
There's a group called the Bible Project that does this so well, it, they do it so better than I ever could, I figured let's just listen to them talk about an overview of the letter to the Ephesians. Let's check this out. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. The story of how Paul came to the city of Ephesus is really interesting. You can go read about it in Acts chapter 19. Ephesus was a huge city. It was the epicenter of worship for most of the Greek and Roman gods. And for over two years, Paul had a really effective missionary presence there and lots of people became followers of Jesus. Years later, after being imprisoned by the Romans, Paul wrote this letter. The movement of thought in the letter divides into two really clear halves. In the first half, Paul is exploring the story of the gospel, how all history came to its climax in Jesus and in his creation of this multi-ethnic community of his followers. The second half of the letter is linked to the first by the word, therefore. And here Paul explores how the gospel story should affect how we live every part of our life story personally, in our neighborhoods and communities, and in our families. So let's dive in and we can see how Paul develops all of this. Chapter 1 opens with a beautiful Jewish style poem where Paul praises God the Father for the amazing things that he has done in Christ Jesus. From eternity past, the Father has purpose to choose and bless a covenant people. And think here, the family of Abraham and Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 3. And through Jesus now, anyone can be adopted into that family. Jesus' death covers our worst sins, our worst failures, and in Jesus we find God's grace. In fact, Paul says, that grace has opened up a whole new way for us to understand every part of our lives. He says in chapter 1 verse 10, that God's purpose was to unify all things in heaven and on earth, under Christ, which is a title that means Messiah. God's plan was always to have a huge family of restored human beings who are unified in Jesus the Messiah. This divine purpose became clear, Paul says, when we were first made into that family. And here he's referring to ethnic Jews in the family of Abraham. But then Paul talks about how you, and here he means non-Jews, you all heard about Jesus and the salvation through him. And you were also brought into this family by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so here he's referring to the events told in the stories of Acts about how God's Spirit brought together Jew and non-Jew into one family in Jesus. It's just like God promised to Abraham long ago. Notice also how in this poem, Paul begins by talking about God the Father, but then about Jesus the Son, and then here at the end about the Spirit. All three work together as Paul tells the story of the gospel. It's really cool. After the poem, Paul responds with a prayer. He prays that these followers of Jesus would not just know about, but personally experience the power of the gospel, that they would be energized by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and placed him as the exalted head of the whole world. Now in chapter two, Paul goes back and he elaborates on some key ideas from the poem in chapter one, especially God's grace and this new multi-ethnic family of Jesus. He begins by retelling the story of how these non-Jewish Christians came to know Jesus. Before hearing about Jesus, they were physically alive, but they were spiritually dead. They were trapped in a purposeless life of selfishness and sin, and they were deceived by dark spiritual forces of evil. But amazingly, God in his great love and mercy, he saved them, he forgave all of their sins, and he joined their lives to Jesus' resurrection life, and he's brought them back to life too. And so now, having been created as new human beings through Jesus, they have the joy of discovering all of the new calling and purposes and tasks that God has set before them. Not only have they been shown God's grace, they've also been invited into a new family. Before hearing about Jesus, these non-Jewish people, they were not just cut off from God, they were cut off from his covenant people, the family of Abraham. And for a really practical reason, the commands of the Sinai covenant, they formed like a boundary line around the family. They were like a barrier that kept most non-Jewish people away. But in Jesus, the laws of the Torah have been fulfilled and the barrier is removed. The two ethnic groups have become, as Paul puts it, a new unified humanity that can live together in peace. 
cities. So Paul goes on in chapter 3 to marvel at the unique role that he got to have in spreading this good news to non-Jewish people. And even though he's in prison, he's thanking God for the chance he's had to see this covenant family grow so huge. So Paul closes the first half of the letter with another prayer. This time he prays that Jesus' followers would be strengthened by God's spirit to simply grasp and comprehend the love that Christ has for his people. The second half of the letter begins with Paul shifting gears and he starts challenging the reader to respond to the gospel story by how they live their own life story. So he starts in chapter 4 with just the everyday life of the church. The church is a big family with lots of different kinds of people, but he emphasizes that they are one. And one is a key word in this chapter. They are one body that's unified by one spirit. They have one Lord with one faith. They have one baptism. They believe in one God. That's a lot of unity. However, Paul says unity is not the same thing as uniformity. He goes on to explore how Jesus' new family consists of lots of very, very different kinds of people, but they're all empowered by the one Holy Spirit, each using their unique talents and passions to serve and to love each other and to build up the church. And here he uses two really cool metaphors. One is building up the church as a new temple, and the second is that they are all becoming a new humanity with Jesus as the head. And this new humanity is a metaphor he's going to then run with for the next couple chapters. Paul challenges every Christian to take off their old humanity, like a set of old clothes, and to put on their new humanity in which the image of God is being restored. And he then goes on into this long section where he compares this new and old humanity. So instead of lying, new humans speak truth. Instead of harboring anger, they peacefully resolve their conflict. Instead of stealing, new humans are generous. Instead of gossiping, they encourage people with their words. Instead of getting revenge, new humans forgive. Instead of gratifying every sexual impulse, new humans cultivate self-control of their bodily desires. Instead of getting drunk, new humans come under the influence of God's spirit. And he spells out what that influence looks like in four different ways. The first two have to do with singing, singing together, but also singing alone. And this is really interesting that the first thing that Paul thinks of about how the Spirit works in the lives of Jesus' people is singing and music. The third sign of the Spirit's influence is being thankful for everything. And the fourth is that the Spirit will compel Jesus' followers to put themselves underneath others and to elevate others as more important than themselves. And Paul actually expands on this fourth point by showing how it works in Christian marriage. So you have a wife who follows Jesus. She is called to respect and to allow her husband to become responsible for her. And the husband is called to love his wife and to use his responsibility to lay down his selfish agenda and to prioritize his wife's well-being above his own. And Paul says it's this kind of marriage that's actually reenacting the gospel story. The husband's actions mimic Jesus and his love and his self-sacrifice. The wife's actions mimic the church, which allows Jesus to love her and to make her new. Paul then applies the same idea to children and parents as well as slaves and masters. Paul closes out the letter by reminding these Christians of the reality of spiritual evil. These are beings and forces that will try to undermine the unity of Jesus' people and to compromise their new humanity. And so Paul challenges them to stand firm and to put on this metaphorical set of body armor, which he describes in detail. And Paul has drawn all of these pieces of body armor from the book of Isaiah and how Isaiah depicted the messianic king. And so now, as the Messiah's followers, we need to make the Messiah's attributes our own since we make up Jesus' body. Practically, I think Paul means for Christians to begin to form habits, proactively using prayer and the scriptures and our relationships with each other to help us grow and mature as followers of Jesus. And that's the letter to the Ephesians. Very powerful. It's where Paul summarizes the whole gospel story and how it should reshape every part of our life story. Yeah, that's impressive. So are you excited about exploring the letter to the Ephesians over these next few weeks, right? That, that's my heart, is that all of a sudden, maybe you've read it a million times, maybe you've never read the Bible before in your life, but now it's like, man, 
I know a little bit about this place called Ephesus. I know a little bit about this guy named Paul. And I know a little bit about the circumstances they were in. There's idolatry going on. There's self-worship. And this community of believers is trying to live out this gospel witness that Jesus has said he wants us to bring the kingdom into the world. That's what we're going to explore over the next few weeks. So let me give you three very quick big ideas and we're going to be done. The first big idea we're going to see over the next few weeks is this. Our identity is found in Christ and our actions flow from there. The first three chapters are all about who we are in Christ Jesus. And can I tell you something? Our world has this entirely backwards. People are trying to define themselves by what they do or what has been done to them. And they're defining their identity based on that. Paul reminds us and Jesus reminds us, it's all about knowing who you are first in Christ Jesus so that now you know what to do. And we're going to see that Ephesians 1 says this, even before we made the world, verse 4, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. I want you to know he wants to know you, and it gives him great pleasure to know you. This is his heart towards you today. Second big idea we're going to see in the next few weeks in the letter to uh, to the Ephesians, we are bringing God's kingdom to earth every day. It's not just one day we go and be with the Lord. No, we get to bring his kingdom to the earth every day. We're supposed to bring the kingdom of God to the grocery store. We're supposed to bring it to the post office. We're supposed to bring it to the traffic jam, to the PTO meeting. We're supposed to bring the kingdom we get to do it every day. Ephesians 4, 21, since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes, put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. When we live that way in this world, we are seen as different. And the reason's not because we're awesome. It's because of what he has done. The third big idea we're going to see in the next few weeks is this is a spiritual battle that requires spiritual weapons. Ephesians 6, 10, 11, and verse 18, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on all God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Verse 18, pray in the spirit at all times on every occasion, stay alert, be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Tried my best not to make this uh, too much of drinking from the fire hose of information. I'm sorry if I did not succeed in that, but here's my heart. Here's what I want to remind you. Context matters. And it means a lot to me that you would want to read these letters because they're precious to me. And maybe they didn't mean anything to you until you understood a little bit more about what it was all about. And that's why we study the scriptures. That's why we do it. Because Jesus said, in them you find me. And he says it's important to him. He says, I want you to consume this word. You find me in it. And in all truth, we can kind of say, well, I've been to church and I prayed a prayer and I went to vacation Bible school and I I shook the clown's hand and I'm going to heaven. And so praise God. And I'm not trying to belittle anyone's story, but can I just tell you something? If that was your attitude towards these letters, I wouldn't even let you touch them. Because it's precious to me. And I want to challenge you, man. God's word is precious. You know, my my mom did an amazing job, such, such an amazing example of letting me know what was important to her in this life. And as impressive as these letters are, what she made sure I understood is that this was what she was most impressed with. And I have vivid memories of my mom every morning being up before all of us sitting at the table cup of coffee in hand, her devotion book and the scriptures and 
her just working it out, asking questions. You don't have to have it all figured out. He's Nathan, I've tried to read the Bible. It didn't really connect with me. I don't know what to do. That's okay. Just stick with it. Just stick with it. There's a lot of things you didn't understand the first time you tried something, but stick with it. I'll tell you something. The Bible is the only book that reads you way more than you read it. It's also the only book you'll ever read where the author will sit with you every time you open it up. God, the Holy Spirit, wants to tell you. He wants to meet with you through these Holy Scriptures. And yes, he used Paul to write the letter, but it was God's words. And it's not just for the Ephesians, it's for us today. So I'll leave you with a challenge as we close today. Paul was uniquely qualified to write the letter to the Ephesians because of his life story. God used everything he had been through, his upbringing, his childhood, his education, lack thereof in certain areas, things he experienced, to share it. That was part of his call. So here's my question to you. How has your life story prepared you for the ministry God is calling you to today? Some of you say, Nathan, though, it sounds like you had a really great mom. That wasn't my story. I didn't grow up in a Christian house. My parents were alcoholics. Do you not think there are kids growing up in alcoholic homes that don't need someone to minister to them today? No matter what you've walked through, no matter what you've navigated, God wants to use your story uniquely to minister to other people. And I'm asking you to ask that question this week. How have you used my life story to uniquely qualify me for what you're calling me to do today? Can I tell you something? If you'll ask, he will answer you because he wants you to know. And here's a final practical challenge. I want to challenge you to read the letter to the Ephesians three times this week, all the way through in one sitting. Six chapters. I timed myself. I did it four times this week. I timed myself. It took me 10 minutes to read Ephesians 1 through 6, starting at the beginning and just right on through. We've kind of conditioned ourselves to read chapter and verse. But remember, it wasn't written that way. It was subdivided that way for our benefit to know where we are. It was a letter. My mom didn't say page one, paragraph two, verse three. She shared her heart. So you will reconnect to it as a letter if you'll read it as a a continuity. So I want to challenge, it took me 10 minutes. You've watched YouTube videos way longer than 10 minutes, okay? So take 10 minutes and read the letter to the Ephesians. Try to do it three times this week. And here's why I challenge you to do that. I believe you will see things you never saw before. I believe the Lord will speak to you in ways you've never experienced before. And I think based on some of this context, you'll feel like you get it better than you've ever gotten it before. And that's my heart for you today. And I believe it's God's heart for you. Would you bow your heads this morning? Father, in Jesus' name, I've done my best to set us up to experience your word in the best way I know how, God. So I pray we'd meet you in your scriptures. I pray we'd meet you in this word that for generations and centuries, men and women have given their lives to make sure it stays preserved so that we could have it. Where all over the world, people hide copies, even just pages because it's illegal for them to own it and they treat it with such respect. Oh God, would you call us back to an all in reverence for your word today and meet us in your word. Pray for every person in this room that doesn't know you today and they feel stirred in their heart that then you, you wanna know them and you're calling them by that gracious love that you extend to all of us. God, I pray that today they'd answer. For the person that has called you Lord and Savior, but maybe hasn't spent time in your word. I pray for a renewed passion to pick it up again and root and ground themselves in the truth of your word so that we could live steady in these very unstable days. And Lord, I pray that you would surprise us by meeting with us in beautiful ways this week as we value time in scripture. Teach us your ways that we'd walk in your truth. 
give us undivided hearts that we'd fear your name. You're here today and you don't know what God's calling you to. You don't know how God wants to use your story in the way that he uniquely used Paul to be able to address the Ephesians and so many others with the truth of God's word. I just want to encourage you in these moments as the worship team takes these next few minutes and just sings over us as we conclude our service. Don't move a whole lot. Just ask the Lord to show you what is uniquely calling you to do. That doesn't mean you have to have it figured out or know what the next step is. Just say yes and then trust him for the rest. And as we worship, invite the Holy Spirit to lead you in the days ahead, to meet you in these times of reading scripture and then Pastor Abe's gonna come and dismiss the service. So all together, let's sing this.